in the musical Jesus Christ Superstar, um, Jesus is being mocked, and Herod is, is asking him why he thinks he's God, and, and Jesus is responding, and then Herod turns aside and says to the audience, he thinks he's God. And it's humorous, and people laugh. And that's kind of how the Jewish people were when Jesus came to the world and he was born of, of a virgin and, and he fulfilled so many prophecies of his coming as the Messiah, but still he came into his own and his own received him not. They expected him to be something other than a child born in Bethlehem, raised in Galilee. And they just kind of had that attitude. He thinks he's God. And so a lot of his life was proclaiming that he was God, proclaiming that God was his father, doing miracles to show the power of God that worked through him. And a lot of people just thought they were magic tricks. But yet some believed him. Well, when John was writing his gospel, he wanted to be very upfront and say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, throughout history, and I wanted to say this too, in the fourth century, they, the people believed that Jesus was not God, and it precipitated a, a religious battle that went on and on for a long time trying to determine what the church would believe, even the Christian church. Then when the Muslims overran Asia Minor, they converted the Christian churches to mosques. And over the doors of the ransacked churches, they put these words, God did not beget and is not begotten. Denying the power of Christ and who he was. However offensive that is, and however divisive that is, the truth is that Jesus is God. And we are confronted with that in, in John's opening statement in his book. Some would argue that it doesn't say that Jesus is Christ at all, is God at all. Some would say in our modern day that Jesus is not, a, not God, he's just a God. Reducing his power from the Almighty to just a good man. But I'd like to make these points where it says, in the beginning was the word, the, and if you study the Greek and the Hebrew, but in the Greek it says, that the word always was God. The interpretation of that, the word always was God. Ever since the beginning, the word was God, and there was never a time when he was not God. Okay? If John wanted to say that the word was merely divine or a God, he could have used a different word. But he used a word theos, T-H-E-O-S, which means God. Jesus Christ, the Word, is God. Now, the passage is not saying that God is everything Jesus was, and Jesus was everything God was, because they are both God. They are one, but they have different duties to fulfill. So, I don't want to be confusing here. They're still one, but they had different things to do. It's saying that the, whatever is true of God is also true of Jesus. In one sense, they share an identity, but in another sense, they're separate entities. The New English Bible translation says, what God was, the Word was. So John is stating in this first verse that Jesus, the Word, is God. Now, 
the word used to say that he dwelt among us is the same word that in the Old Testament meant tabernacle. And Dave and I preached for about four weeks recently about the Ark of the Covenant, about the temple, about the tabernacle, about the holy place where the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant was stored and the people went to make, to bring offerings. The high priest went into the Holy of Holies and sacrificed those offerings to God. That's where God met with the priests and where God extended forgiveness because of their offerings that were made. That's the same word that is applied to Jesus. Because after Jesus came and shed his blood and was sacrificed for our sins, that's where we met God. Not in a holy of holies physical place, but through Jesus. He became that physical holy of holies and became a spiritual. Spiritual being, spirit, spirit that we could meet God through. When we talk about in the beginning was the word, the word is tran is okay, what's the word? Interpreted when when they took it from the Greek and made it English, the Greek word, thank you, was logos. And when we think of logos, logos, it's like the um, picture that we identify brands with. Like NBC, it's the peacock, right? Or um, I'm having a hard time. Logos, the cross on the communion cup for First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. You know, many, many logos. And, and that's how we identify the product. Well, that word also is from the Greek word logos. And so when it says he was the word, what does that mean? It's a bit of a, of a hard thing to understand because the word logos comes from a pagan word which had two different interpretations. And one was that reality is, consists of two realms, the spiritual and the physical. And a lot of times we think, well, we're not going to honor that because that's pagan and because we want to honor God who's holy. But God can use all things to make a point, to be understood. So when, God, when John used the word logos to, to say that Jesus was the word, what he said was that Jesus came the creator of all things physical, the eternal spiritual being, he blended those two things into one in himself. Okay, Jan, so now you're saying a pagan thing is a good thing. I have a very up-to-date example of that. There's a song that Bob Dylan sang. It's called The House of the Rising Sun. This is pagan in my estimation. There is a house in New Orleans they call the Rising Sun, and it's been the ruin of many a poor girl, and God, I know I'm one. My mother was a tailor. She sewed my new blue jeans. My father was a gambling man down in New Orleans. This song doesn't get any better. Oh, tell my baby sister not to do what I have done, but shun that house in New Orleans they call the Rising Sun. I'm going back to New Orleans. My race is almost run. I'm going back to end my life down in the rising sun. That's pagan. That is worldly. That is without hope. But Dottie introduced to us the gospel version of that. And she sang it for us so beautifully, and now Michael has stolen it from her and sings it also. And Last Friday night, a week ago, I stole a verse from Michael because it's just great to sing because it's such a wonderful message. 
we took something totally pagan and we made it have a gospel message. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm blind. <laughs> found, now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. And there's hope at the end of this amazing grace. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Taken that song that was written about a house of prostitution, about gambling, about people losing their souls, and we've taken that same tune and we've made it something holy. And that's what that word logos did. It took something that was pagan and applied it to Jesus Christ, the word of God, who is holy, and gives hope, takes away despair, gives us hope. The point is that Jesus, the word, and God are one. Jesus, the word, is God's agent in creating the universe and sustaining the universe. And the word, Jesus, is both received by the world and rejected by the world. That has not changed since the beginning when people rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Still, you know, the world rejects Jesus today. He came into his own, but his own received him not, according to scripture. Jesus was the promised Messiah who came to the nation, Israel, to redeem them and save them, but they did not receive him. The Jews, we know, were God's chosen people. We've talked many times about how God chose the Israelite nation for Jesus to come through, for them to know who he was and receive him. They were called the children of God. He was called to be the light of the world. Through the Jewish nation came the priests, that made the sacrifices so that the sins could be covered. But still, the Jewish people did not receive him as their savior. Their rejection caused the world to be lost until Jesus came and says, I don't care if you reject me or not, I'm your savior. Because it was planned before the foundations of the world, because it was always God's eternal plan, Jesus came to die for us on a cross, to shed his blood, to be the perfect sacrifice for mankind, and then to rise again, to give eternal life to each one of us. And then the gift of eternal life was not just for the Jewish people, but was for all mankind. To as many as would receive him, he gave the gift of eternal life. Which one are you? Are you one that said, nice trick when Jesus did his miracles? Can you do it again? Or are you, are you the one that said, truly, truly, this is the Son of God? Are you a fan or a follower? For those of us who believe in Jesus and receive him, he gives us the right to become the children of God. And that right doesn't mean just the ability. It means the status of a child of God. God graciously bestows the status of being his child upon us. We're now a son or a daughter of the living God. There's no greater status than being a son or daughter of the living God, a child of God, you name it. Prime minister, king, queen, president, ambassador, doctor, professor, attorney, whatever. Whatever you view as having status is nothing compared to the status of being a child of God. 
those, those things that we give status to in our society are worthless in comparison to the richness and the privilege of being a child of God. By faith we receive him. By faith we receive that he is the word of God, that he is God incarnate. We receive the sacrifice that he did for us. We become his children. We become part of the heavenly family, visibly represented to the world, all of us as children of God, as true believers in who he is and what he did for us. Those who refuse to believe who he is and refuse to give him his due and accept him as a personal savior, John 3.18 says, whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. But those who do believe in him, in John 3.16, have eternal life through Jesus. In Christ, God gives grace upon grace to those who receive him. Jesus came as the word. He was the word of God, the one equal to God, who was God, before the written word ever came into being. He was made known to all of those who were there to see that crucifixion, who were there to see the miracles, who were there to hear him teach. Then the written word came. And those are two different words in the Bible, and that's where we're going to be next Sunday. But I would like to conclude this because um, this is a favorite chorus of mine. Thy word is the lamp unto my feet, and I gave my words to Brad's. Going to need them. All right. I need to look over somebody's shoulder. Here's Not one. that one. Where's the big print? This one? That one. <laughs> and you probably know this. It, um, Amy Grant is the one that uh, made this song popular. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Sing that over again. guide you this week. Let him be the lamp unto your feet and the light unto your path as you recognize that he is God, he is the word, and he is here to make us one 
with God, rightly dividing the word of truth so that we have eternal life with him forever. <laughs>